and gentlemen, welcome to our program, the 2023 Joseph Story Distinguished Lecture. Please welcome John Malcolm, Vice President of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. I would like to welcome you all uh, to the Heritage Foundation and to the Joseph Story Distinguished Lecture. Uh, as you heard, my name is John Malcolm. I'm the Vice President of the Institute for Constitutional Government here. So this lecture has been named in honor of one of our country's most eminent jurists and legal scholars, a man who, in fact, distinguished himself, uh, distinguished himself in many ways. Joseph Story was involved in politics and civic activities in his native state of Massachusetts. After several years in private practice, he served in the Massachusetts State Legislature for part of that time as Speaker of the House and then in the United States Congress. Pretty remarkable when you consider that he did all of that before being confirmed as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court at the age of 32, the youngest justice in our nation's history. In addition to serving with distinction on the High Court for 33 years, Story was instrumental in establishing the Harvard Law School, where he served as its Dane Professor of Law. Story was also an accomplished writer whose articles and books were praised on both sides of the Atlantic. His most famous work, of course, is his commentaries on the Constitution, which demonstrated his commitment to faithfully interpreting the Constitution as it was understood by those who wrote it and ratified it. The influence of Story's commentaries continues to be felt today among the judiciary and constitutional scholars. We are indeed fortunate tonight to have Judge James Ho as this year's Story Lecturer. Judge Ho sits on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, having been confirmed in January of 2018. Prior to becoming a judge, Judge Ho was a partner at the law firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, and he served for three years as the Solicitor General of Texas. In each of those years, Judge Ho won the Best Brief Award, which was awarded by the National Association of Attorneys General, which comes as no surprise to anyone who has read those briefs or any of his judicial opinions. Judge Ho also served as chief counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on the Constitution and Immigration, and as a special assistant to the head of the Civil Rights Division, and as an attorney advisor at the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department. Judge Ho began his legal career as a law clerk to Judge Jerry Smith, who is now his colleague on the Fifth Circuit, and to Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. Many of us, of course, would be happy to see Judge Ho serve as Justice Thomas's colleague on that court, too. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Judge Jim Ho. Well, thank you, John, for that uh, kind and at times absurd introduction. <laughs> I, I am very honored uh, to deliver this year's Joseph Story Lecture, uh, particularly when you look at uh, the, those who spoke before me. It's a particularly absurd privilege. John, th th as I said, that was very nice. Uh, you and I have been friends uh, really since we were both at the Justice Department uh, back in 2001. Uh, but actually, my history with the Heritage Foundation uh, goes back even further than that. Uh, I was checking my... Uh, records uh, preparing for this, and I noticed actually that 25 years ago this week, I attended my first Heritage Legal Strategy Forum. General Meese had invited me uh, to present a law review article that I had co-authored about racial preferences and, the, uh, and, and illegal appointments at the Justice Department. And, and soon after that, he sat down with me for an interview for the Green Bag uh, on the importance of originalism. I was just a law student. Uh, so you can imagine the formative and lasting influence that General Meese had on me. He inspired me to pursue public service, and he gave me the confidence that I might actually be able to do it. And for that, I am profoundly grateful to General Meese and to the Heritage Foundation. One of my favorite privileges of being a federal judge is the honor of presiding over a naturalization ceremony. 
I do it every year in May to celebrate the anniversary of my own naturalization in May 1982. I wasn't born in the United States, so I, I, I did not enter this world as an American, uh, but I wake up every morning thanking God that I will leave this world as an American. I like to say that I'm Taiwanese by birth, Texan by marriage, but most importantly, I'm American by choice. If you've never attended a naturalization ceremony, there's nothing more inspiring. People from all around the world come together in one room for one purpose, to become Americans. As Americans, we should never forget how special it is to live in a place that people all around the world would literally do anything to join. There aren't a lot of countries that you can say that about. And it reminds you that people aren't desperate to come to America in droves because it's a failed nation. They're desperate to come to America because it's the most successful nation in human history. And it's worth thinking about why that is. It's not because we're all the same, because we're not. We're different in so many ways. We look different. We come from different backgrounds. We practice different faiths. We hold different opinions on a wide range of subject, subjects, and we disagree on so very many things. In a nation of over 300 million Americans, we're never going to agree on everything. We're all committed to the same basic principles of liberty, equality, but we have vigorous disagreements and boisterous debates about what those principles require in practice. So how are we supposed to come together when we disagree so passionately about so much? Well, our nation's uh, founders debated this very topic. The Federalists urged that despite our many differences, the former colonies would be much better off together as one united country that we would enjoy enormous economic, diplomatic, security, foreign policy, and various other advantages that naturally flow from scale. The Anti-Federalists thought that was crazy. They reminded us that no republic in history had ever succeeded anywhere near that size. They feared that we would be too diverse. They worried that we would bicker endlessly, get nothing done, and they believed that we would be better off by and large apart. The Federalists prevailed in the debate by offering two critical ingredients for avoiding endless conflict, federalism and freedom of speech. We would do at the national level what must be done at the national level, but we would leave ample space for differing viewpoints, and we would have the freedom to advocate and advance our beliefs in our respective state and local communities nationwide. But we cannot lightly assume that these founding values will always persist. They must be nurtured and taught. They must be passed down from generation to generation. President Reagan warned us that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Allison and I are blessed with a twin daughter and son. They are the joy of our lives. But when they bicker, they really bicker. And when they do, you can predict what happens next. Retaliation. If you won't agree with me, you can't come into my room. You can't play with my toys. You can't borrow my books. And no, I won't talk to you, except to tell you that I won't talk to you. <laughs> But here's the thing. Kids are supposed to grow out of it. We're supposed to instill in them values like respect and charity. We're supposed to teach them that there will always be disagreements, but that we should always try to presume good faith from our fellow man, that we often have more to learn from those we disagree with than those who are already with us that we have established peaceful, respectful ways of resolving our differences, and that, win, lose, or draw, we're better off together than apart. As parents, we're supposed to teach these principles to our children, and these lessons are supposed to be reinforced by teachers, colleges, and universities. Unfortunately, our nation's institutions of higher education don't seem to be fostering these principles very well. 
students today don't seem to value the rigorous exchange of ideas the way we used to. According to the Brookings Institution, 50% of college students say that it's okay to shout down any speaker you disagree with. One in five, according to that study, one in five say that violence can be appropriate. That was back in 2017. The numbers may be even higher today. According to a 2023 survey by the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, today two thirds of college students now say that it's okay to shout down a speaker you oppose. And 41% of students now say that violence may be appropriate, according to a 2022 Buckley Institute report. So it's no wonder that we're seeing more and more disruptions on law school campuses nationwide against respected legal scholars, accomplished litigators, and an increasing number of federal judges. Campus disruptions seem to be happening more frequently, and when they do happen, they're getting more attention. But here's the thing. These campus disruptions aren't the core problem. They're just a symptom of the problem. The real problem in the academy is not disruption, it's discrimination. Rampant, blatant discrimination against disfavored viewpoints, against students, faculty, or anyone else who dares to voice a view that may be mainstream across America, but are contrary to the views of cultural elites. And let's just say it, the viewpoint discrimination we most often see in the academy today is discrimination against religious conservatives. Just look at the dramatic absence of intellectual diversity on our nation's college faculties and amongst university administrators. What message does it send when colleges and universities say they believe in diversity, but they systematically exclude certain views from the faculty lounge? It says that viewpoint diversity may be important, but that some views are beyond the pale. It says that it's okay to exclude the deeply held good faith views of millions of Americans and our, uh, millions of our fellow countrymen from the nation's discourse. The typical justification that you'll hear for this discrimination is that some religious conservative views are just too much. They make people feel unsafe. So it's okay to eliminate these views from campus. But that's not why they're expelling these viewpoints from campus. They're not doing it for safety reasons. They're doing it for substantive ideological reasons, for discriminatory reasons. Just compare and contrast what we've seen on campus in the past to what we've seen in recent weeks. Expressing religious viewpoints, traditional viewpoints, gets you vilified. But claiming a right to eliminate a religious group gets you the benefit of the doubt. Voicing traditional values makes people feel unsafe, but supporting terrorism against innocent civilians doesn't. Speech is violence, unless it's speech that cultural elites like. Is there an underlying principle here? I'm not sure there is. I wonder if what's really going on is that some people are disfavored, while others are favored. Some people are deemed oppressors, and others the oppressed. That's wrong, it's un-American, and it's driving more and more of us to ask if our nation's colleges and universities are institutions of higher education or incubators of bigotry. The state of higher education concerns me, and it's not just because our nation's law schools directly impact the work of the judiciary and help constitute the future leadership of our country. It's also because the same toxic discrimination that distorts discourse on college campuses also distorts discourse about the courts. It's the same mindset that motivates the current campaign to undermine the third branch of government. You know, one of the things you're told uh, when you go through the Senate confirmation process for federal judges is that if you say that you're an originalist, you should expect controversy. But it really shouldn't be controversial at all. After all, every judge swears an oath to uphold the Constitution. So being an originalist, is really just part of the job description, because being an originalist just means being faithful to whatever text you're interpreting. Justices Scalia and Thomas repeatedly have described themselves as originalists. So have other members of the Supreme Court. Justice Ginsburg said that she, quote, counts herself as an originalist, too. Justice Kagan declared during her Senate confirmation hearing that we are all originalists. 
Justice Jackson likewise testified that adherence to text is a constraint on my authority. We're bound by the text and what it meant to those who drafted it. So there is a broad consensus in favor of construing legal texts as written, consistent with their original understanding and public meaning. Or at least there's consensus as a matter of theory. It's when you start applying originalism in certain specific contexts that controversy emerges, when originalism happens to lead to results despised by the cultural elites who lead the national discourse. When that happens, originalists face a concerted campaign of condemnation. Originalists are disparaged and destroyed. We're not merely wrong as an intellectual matter. We're not just disagreeing in good faith about the proper meaning of legal terms. We're fundamentally bad people who are just too extreme for polite society. We're mean-spirited, racist, sexist, homophobic. We're just trolling or auditioning. We're unethical, if not corrupt. And I think it's obvious what's going on here. There have been, we've, we've certainly heard plenty of threats about packing the courts, but there's really no need to pack the courts when you can just pressure the courts and get the same result. It's the same pathos that we see on college campuses. It's not enough that I disagree with you. I also have to dislike you and disparage and disrespect you as a human being. Instead of judging your reasoning, I pass judgment on the person behind it. I don't presume good faith. I impute malicious intent. It's a sad way of looking at the world. And it's a bizarre approach to understanding a judiciary that is expressly, avowedly committed to originalism. I'll just give you one recent example. A few months ago, the Supreme Court decided a criminal case called Counterman versus Colorado. The victim in that case is a professional musician who had received thousands of threatening and disturbing messages from the defendant over a number of years. This defendant had previously served time for terrorizing at least four other women. And he was eventually convicted uh, again and imprisoned for more than four years for criminally stalking his latest victim. Yet she remains terrified of him and in hiding to this day. To protect her anonymity, the Supreme Court's recent opinion refers to her only by her initials. By a vote of seven to two, the Supreme Court overturned the conviction as a violation of the First Amendment on the theory that the prosecution wasn't required, uh, as it should have been, to prove a particular mental state for the defendant. Justice Kagan, author of the majority opinion, Justice Sotomayor wrote it at concurrence, Justices Thomas and Barrett dissented. I disagreed with the ruling, suggested as much in an opinion earlier this year. Uh, so did my wife, Allison, who filed an amicus brief on behalf of the victim before the Supreme Court. But although we disagree with the opinion, we would never question the good faith of any of the justices. We would certainly never suggest that any member of the counterman majority is sexist or favors violence against women. Yet that's exactly what at least one leading law professor has done. A few weeks ago, a professor at Georgetown accused the justices in the counterman majority of, and I quote, blindness to gender violence. She called the court, quote, the enemy of popular laws devised to protect women. Well, I don't have to agree with the majority in countermen to recognize that these disparaging remarks are badly mistaken and deeply insulting. And I'd say the same about many other attacks we've recently seen against the justices in many other areas of the law. Judges can and do disagree in good faith about the proper interpretation of legal rules. We ought to be able to disagree with one another without despising one another, even in cases like countermen where passions understandably run high. But no matter how absurd or hateful critics may be, I do thank God that I live in a country and under a constitution that guarantees everyone the right to criticize our officials. That includes judges. In fact, if anyone in public office should be able to ignore criticisms and just do your job, it's presumably those who enjoy life tenure. Citizens have every right to expect federal judges to follow the law in every case, no matter how belligerent or baseless the booing of the crowd, because that's the job. And that raises naturally the question, how are we doing in these jobs? 
The Chief Justice famously compared judges to umpires during his confirmation hearing. I think it's a good metaphor in many respects. But I also do wonder if comparing judges to umpires is ultimately comforting or discomforting. If you're a sports fan like I am, you're no doubt familiar with the phenomenon of home field advantage. Well, there is a fascinating book called Scorecasting. The authors devote an entire chapter of their book to the topic of home field advantage. Based on their extensive analysis, they conclude that home field advantage is a real phenomenon, that the leading cause of home field advantage is the referees, and that it's because the referees are responding to the hometown crowd. As it turns out, most people don't like to be booed. Most people like to be liked. And referees and umpires are no different. The authors begin their analysis with the observation that referees and umpires are, quote, professionals, uncorrupted and incorruptible, consciously doing their best to ensure fairness. They are not, however, immune from, to human psychology. And that's where, the authors think, the explanation for hometown bias resides. Because when they're faced with enormous pressure, say, making a crucial call with a rabid crowd yelling, taunting, and chanting a few feet away, it is natural to want to alleviate that pressure. These authors look at various studies across different sports. In one study, uh, they took a group of refs to watch a soccer game on television with the sound turned on, while they took another group to watch that same game on TV, uh, but in silence. The group watching the game with the sound on called fewer penalties against the home team and more against the away team than the group watching the game in silence. The natural inference being this, the refs were influenced by the booing of the crowd. Other studies uh, document referee bias across a wide range of sports and the great amount, greatest amount of bias when the game is close. In baseball, home teams strike out less and walk more than away teams. In football, away teams are penalized more than home teams, particularly when the penalty results in a first down for the offense. The authors found similar effects in basketball and hockey. And they ultimately conclude that, quote, referee bias from social influence is not only present, it's the leading cause of home field advantage. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has actually given us a, cha a chance to test this uh, hypothesis in the real world. And that's because due to government lockdown policies, we now have experience running live soccer games without any hometown crowd. And it turns out that it proves the authors right. Without crowds, these refs penalized home teams as much as away teams. So if we take the Chief Justice's umpire metaphor seriously, we also need to be aware and wary of what that metaphor foretells. Americans are passionate about our sports teams, but we're also passionate about our politics. And in sports and politics alike, judges must have not only the intellect, but also the fortitude to be impartial, no matter how angry the crowd. Judges must not be afraid of being booed. But here's the problem. There's good reason to worry that judges are, if anything, even more susceptible to hometown bias than umpires. For umpires and referees, the booing is transient, it's fleeting. You make a call, the fans boo, but it only lasts for a few seconds. The game moves on, the crowd moves on, nobody knows who you are, they don't know your name. So the moment passes, it doesn't follow the ref around. That's just not true with judges. Most fans don't know the name of the ref who makes a call that they dislike, but it's very easy to know the name of the judge who writes an opinion you despise. And people can spend their whole life publicly disparaging that judge if they want. Now you might think, well, isn't that why judges have life tenure? To make sure that they ignore public opprobrium and just do their jobs. And of course, you'd be exactly right. Public criticism isn't supposed to have any impact. Judges and refs are supposed to follow principle, not popularity, in their decision making. <clears throat> judges, like refs, are supposed to know supposed to know that uh, whether a decision is lawful is orthogonal to whether it's loved. But that leads to uh, a second uh, and even more important reason why booing can make a bigger difference on judges than on refs. I call it the gold star syndrome. When you look at the typical resume of a federal judge, 
you often see a series of fancy credentials, fancy law school, fancy clerkships, fancy law firms, and government positions. And with folks like that, with people who are typically used to collecting gold stars, they tend to be motivated by one overarching objective, collecting even more gold stars. A Harvard undergraduate recently published a remarkably self-aware essay in the Wall Street Journal. Here's what she said. Our life's mission has been to please those who can grant or withhold approval, parents, teachers, coaches, admissions officers, job interviewers. As a result, many of us don't know what we believe or what matters to us. My peers and I are often told that we are the future leaders of America. Well, we may be the future decision makers, but most of us aren't leaders. Our principal concern is becoming members of the American elite with whatever compromises, concessions, and conformity that requires. I think this Harvard undergrad is spot on. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if the pursuit of gold stars explains a lot of the behavior we see in elite colleges and universities. And we can certainly have a debate about what we think about that. But it's emphatically not the behavior we should hope to see in our nation's judges. If you plan to be faithful to the Constitution in every case, no matter how unpopular that may be, gold stars are not in the cards for you. But that is the job. Judges don't swear an oath to uphold the Constitution part of the time. They swear an oath to uphold the Constitution all of the time. I'll use, uh, with your indulgence, another sports analogy. You've heard of fair weather fans. Well, if you're an originalist, only when elites won't be upset with you. If you're an originalist, only when it's easy. That's not principled judging. That's fair weather originalism. We're not binding ourselves to the text if we follow it only when people like the result. Originalism is either a matter of principle or nothing more than a talking point. Fair weather originalism isn't originalism. Because if you're not an originalist in every case, then you're really not an originalist at all. Moreover, there is a perverse irony to fair weather originalism. If you're a law nerd like me, you might find debates about judicial me methodology endlessly fascinating, no matter what the underlying legal issue may be. The first time I was assigned an opinion for our en banc court, uh, we were divided by a vote of 10 to 2 to 4. We spent, or my colleagues and I spent 55 pages debating the meaning of Rule 54B of the rules, of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. These legal issues that we decided in that case are fascinating to absolutely nobody, <laughs> including me, and I wrote two opinions in the case. For millions of Americans, their passion for originalism is not some abstract academic question of interpretive methodology. For millions of Americans, their passion for originalism comes from the fact that they like the Constitution. They like what it says. They like what it protects and shields against the ravages of the mob. And they like what it entrusts to the people and to the democratic process to decide. How tragically ironic it would be then to practice a form of originalism that governs every legal dispute under the sun except the most important ones. So what should judges do when people boo? I have three thoughts. First, learn to expect it. Judges should expect people to boo. Criticism of judges is nothing new, and it's certainly not going anywhere. Thomas Jefferson once blasted the entire judiciary as a, quote, subtle core of sappers and miners constantly working underground to undermine the foundations of our confederated fabric. I confess, I'm not sure what that means, but it, does, it doesn't sound good. Teddy Roosevelt once said about Oliver Wendell Holmes that you could, quote, carve out of a banana a judge with more backbone than him. <laughs> that doesn't sound nice either. Criticism of judges is historical because it's natural. You can't tell people not to be upset with the outcome of a particular case they care about because you cannot tell people not to feel what they feel. I'm a big Stanford football fan, all right? Come on, Nick. Come on, Nick. Beat Cal. You can't. I'm a big Stanford football fan. You, you threw me there, buddy. I've been to every Rose Bowl game Stanford has ever attended in my lifetime. It's, it's not many, but I've been to all of them. 
So when I boo a ref, and yes, it's when, not if I boo a ref, it's not because I have some deep philosophical disagreement with the underlying principles that the ref is applying when he calls pass interference. I'm booing because I want Stanford to win. And I would say that it's the God-given right of every red-blooded American to yell at refs. And I'd say the exact same thing about criticizing judges. Maybe this is just the former litigator in me. But if I'm in a charitable mood, I might just view criti criticisms of judges as just another form of passionate, aggressive advocacy. And there's even a term for it. It happens to be another sports analogy. It's called working the refs. On the other hand, if I'm feeling less charitable, one might view certain critics as nothing more than playground bullies, people who can't just rely on text or truth to win, and so they instead have to resort to yelling and screaming and name-calling to get their way. But either way, whether you take the charitable or uncharitable view, the lesson for judges is ultimately the same. As judges, it's our duty to do our jobs and to ignore the booing of the crowd. If you're looking for gold stars, you are in the wrong business. You should become a judge for public service, not public applause. Because if you do the job faithfully, you should expect to be either hated or ignored. Moreover, there's another reason why judges should expect to be booed. It's not just because we live in a free country where people have the right to boo. It's also because we live in a diverse country where you can find people who hold any number of views across a wide, a wide spectrum. Some of the harshest critics of originalist judges, in fact, happen to hold some of the most extreme views in our country. And sometimes they say the quiet part out loud. Some have called the Constitution trash, written by slavers. Some have celebrated the discrimination and disruption we've been seeing on law school campuses. Some have condemned religious conservatives as undeserving of respect. Some have advocated treating people differently, even choosing who to put in prison based on the color of their skin. Needless to say, I strongly disagree with all those views. But I mention them because it may explain a lot about what's being said. If you don't like colorblindness, then of course you're not going to like colorblind judges. If you think our Constitution is trash, then of course you'll trash people who follow it faithfully. If you don't like our Constitution, then you're not going to like originalism. My second thought is this. You should not only expect booing, you should get used to it. Because it's not going away anytime soon. For too long, we've been sending the message that to achieve your desired outcomes, you don't have to persuade. You can just pressure and punish. We've taught the next generation that you can win the argument without actually winning the argument. And it doesn't matter if you prove time and time again that criticisms won't affect you. Because when it comes to cancel culture, the intended audience isn't the target of the attacks. It's everyone else. So get used to it. The good news is that you can get used to it. I'll use an analogy that comes uh, mercifully not from sports, but science. Biosphere 2 is a science research facility in Arizona. It's the largest fully enclosed ecological system ever created. Scientists have used it to study a number of natural phenomena. One thing they learned, by accident actually, is that when you have a completely enclosed environment, trees grow very quickly, but then they start to collapse. They discovered that this idyllic environment is really good for trees at first, but then it spells disaster. That's because inside an enclosed facility, there's no wind. So trees never get the chance to learn how to stand against the wind. They don't develop the natural strength they'll need to prosper later in life. They never develop what's known as stress wood. Now, a life without stress may sound great at first, but trees actually need stress to become strong. They need stress to learn how to survive the harsh weather conditions they know they're going to encounter later in life. Stress wood is ultimately the only cure for gold star syndrome. It inoculates you to harsh criticism. It's a natural immunity that you can only build up over time, both before and after you take the bench. If you're gonna do this job, stress is guaranteed. Criticism is unavoidable. You just have to learn not to worry about it. 
So my advice is you do what refs do. Do your job and then go home. Have a wonderful, fulfilling personal life. When you look in the mirror, you should see a mom, a dad, a husband, a wife. But if what you see in the mirror is a judge, if your whole life's purpose is to wear black robes, then maybe you shouldn't. My third and final thought, don't just expect harsh criticism, don't just get used to it, you should also get comfortable with it. We are all extraordinarily blessed to live in this amazing country. And some of us are even fortunate to play at least some small role in helping to lead this country forward, whether we're judges or leading practitioners in the law or influential legal scholars or any number of other positions. But that privilege can come with, at a cost. To use an analogy, being faithful to the Constitution is like being a faithful Christian. As the Bible teaches, Christians should expect to be criticized. I'll read just a few verses from chapter 4 of Peter's first epistle. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Chief Justice Roberts analogizes judges to umpires. But if we have to use a sports metaphor, I've got another idea. I mentioned earlier that I like football. I'm also a big fan of tennis and lately pickleball. The US Open is one of my, I don't know why that's a laugh line. <laughs> Wasn't written as a laugh line. Um, the US Open is one of my favorite tennis tournaments. In fact, my post-college graduation vacation, I included a trip to New York uh, to watch my first US Open uh, in person. The final rounds of the US Open are held at Arthur Ashe Stadium. Those who have had the honor of competing there call it the most intense, stressful, pressure-packed stadium you'll ever play in. And it's not just because the stakes are enormous. The stadium itself is also physically daunting. It's been described as unapologetically large and loud, like its host city. Every player who competes on that court first walks by a plaque that prominently displays four important words. Pressure is a privilege. Those same four words are also what judges should keep in mind every time we step onto the court. Four days before she won this year's women's final, just last month, a reporter asked Coco Goff how she handles the pressures of being a professional tennis player as a 19-year-old. Her response should, should resonate with every member of our profession, lawyers as well as judges. Here's what she said. I think it's just putting my life into perspective. There are people struggling to feed their families, people who don't know where their next meal is going to come from. That's real pressure. That's real hardship. That's real life. I'm in a very privileged position. I'm getting paid to do what I love and getting support to do what I love. There are millions of people who probably want to be in this position. So I should enjoy this. I'm having so much fun doing it, and I shouldn't think about the results. I'm living a lucky life. And I'm so blessed. To that, Coco Goff, I say, amen. Stress is inevitable in our profession, but pressure is a privilege. As judges, we should always remember two things, that there are countless law students, lawyers, and fellow Americans who would do anything to trade places with us. And second, that nobody forced you to become a judge. You agreed to become a judge. Some people even lobby and campaign for it. And you can quit any time you want. It's life tenure, not a life sentence. So you should only do it if you are ready and willing to accept everything that it entails. It is my profound privilege to serve on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And it is my profound privilege to deliver this year's story lecture. Thank you for listening.
in a moment, I'm going to invite uh, audience questions. I really want to save almost all of my time for audience questions. The only thing that I would do is uh, I would say wait for the microphone to come. Uh, this is not your opportunity to give a speech. It is your opportunity to ask a question. So keep it short. End it with a question mark. And don't have it be giving remarks and saying, do you agree with what I just said or not? Um, so my, my question to you is you, you said a couple of times you were a sports fan. So, and you talked about home cooking with the referees. I'm wondering whether you uh, take any heart uh, at the fact that the American League Championship Series between the Texas Rangers <laughs> and the Houston Astros, the home team lost uh, all seven games. And the other thing I would ask you is you said you're a Stanford football fan. In light of what happened to your colleague, uh, you know, Judge Kyle Duncan and the fact that you have now publicly declared that you are not going to hire any Stanford law grads uh, as law clerks, whether you're still welcome at uh, Stanford football games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are tough, two very tough questions. Um, so uh, as to the ACL, yes, first of all, I'm very happy because the Texas Rangers uh, prevailed. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, look, I guess any good advocate, you know, whatever facts uh, come your way, you can always spin it to support your theory. Uh, the recent series, uh, if anything, proves the point, right? It's very rare uh, for that to happen. For a seven, but my understanding, I think I read somewhere that this is only the second time in MLB history that you have a seven game series and the home team never won. That this is the exception, uh, not the rule. Uh, perhaps it also shows that you can, in fact, overcome right. home field advantage. Uh, not to get overly theoretical, but I actually wonder to what extent there was home field advantage. Uh, maybe, maybe the authors of Scorecasting will do another uh, book, but when the teams are so close, I wonder if there's any sort of statistical analysis about home field advantage being less uh, when, when, uh, when the teams are close. Uh, my, my friend uh, from Cal over here knows well, well, big game is played every year that rotates between Stanford and Cal. I don't. Is there a home field advantage? The, the schools are so close, right? I, I wonder if games like that, uh, you, you see less home field advantage, much like the recent ALS, ALCS. Um, your other well, tough question was Stanford. <laughs> yeah, well, who knows when they'll be in the Rose Bowl again. Uh, so, I, but, so following up on <laughs> Well, the Pac-12 so, doesn't exist so anymore. So. Following up on that, actually, so you, you made the same statement, of course, about, about Yale. And then you were invited to Yale, I gather, and then went and, and spoke there. Uh, and they allowed you to speak. So there was no, I assume there were people there making sure that you were allowed to speak. Uh, what, uh, what reaction did you have to, uh, to all of that? Oh, it, it, was, it was a good event. Uh, it was a, a perfectly nice event. We got to meet some of the students, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, you know, what's interesting for what it's worth is uh, after the second event, the one that was actually in front, of, in front of the law school, the first was in front of the Buckley Institute. Uh, the second one, um, uh, Judge Lisa Branch and I received a number of calls and, and, and uh, inquiries uh, from students and scholars at Yale saying, we know you just came, it seemed to go great, please don't withdraw the boycott. They were actually worried that we would sort of be happy and say, you know what, life's good, We'd, uh, no, no more boycott. They, they said specifically, please don't do that, do the opposite. And what they said is because they've noticed a genuine change uh, at the school, but they're worried that it's fleeting. They're worried that it's not going to be permanent. Right. And so, and in fact, the, the, just uh, what, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, there was a faculty appointment announcement. I mentioned faculty uh, intellectual diversity earlier. Um, and again, I got pings from people at Yale. This is good. It's in the right direction. Uh, Keith Whittington will allow students to, to hear more different views. Uh, but please, don't use that as a, an excuse to withdraw the boycott. Uh, we need to see more. Yeah, no, I think what you and Judge Branch uh, did was a, a bold thing to do. And then you had several people, other judges, said, well, we're going to agree, but we're just not going to out ourselves in terms of saying who we are. Uh, but uh, oh, you know that you, you've got to, it's unfortunate you had to do that, but you've you got to have an impact in some way. And, and sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. Nonviolent, but desperate times call for desperate measures. With that, let me uh, open it up for anybody who has a question. Let's come down here with John. Um, sticks and stones will break my bones. Names will never hurt me. Um, I think s the question I have is that we had about two years ago, a New Jersey judge was shot just here in Maryland, just a little bit ago, 
uh, Maryland State Court judge was shot, uh, stabbed, I think, for his uh, ruling in a child custody. We have Brett Kavanaugh was shot. So uh, it does strike me that there may be more going on here than speech that might work the refs a little more than you said. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that and the, whether the atmosphere is causing that? Yeah, I, I, I worry that you may be right, that, that we're, we may be seeing an uptick of this, uh, of this environment. So I don't, I don't have anything profound to say other than uh, genuine concern. Uh, uh, I, I can only imagine all the things that Justice Kavanaugh has had to deal with in these recent years. It's, it's horrifying. Other questions? Over here. You can pass the mic down. Thank you, Judge Ho. Um, having a son in college and also recognizing that your experience speaking to young people is really one of your passion areas. You talked about the willingness to sort of influence the refs, and yet where is the self-limiting principle when we recognize that many of these young people are willing to either shout down or actually exhibit violence towards speakers with which they disagree? Is there an ability that we have for those of us who are conservative scholars, conservative litigators, conservative judges, to be able to say this far and no farther. How can we instruct the next generation? Well, I, I feel terrible for the generation now that's having to go through school. I mean, I uh, you know, was an undergrad at Stanford uh, Law School at Chicago uh, and had, honestly, a, an amazing experience at both institutions. This is obviously back a while ago, during the 90s. Um, was I surrounded with people who loved my views and agreed with me everything I said? No, of course not. Uh, robust debates, and I don't think the, the views, the, 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 in terms of the percentages of views, I don't think that was much different than it is now. But there was a spirit that uh, permitted uh, and, and frankly celebrated uh, exchange. You know, I, we had friends across the spectrum. We'd duke it out uh, in the student lounge, and then we'd uh, have fun together. And that's, that's, to me, that's what this country uh, is, is all about. Uh, and, and what concerns me is I think we're in a, going in a very, very different direction right now. Um, in terms of what, what we can do about it, you know, on the one hand, you know, students, so students actually ask me constantly, you know, what, what should we do? How, what would you have us do when we're dealing with this? And I tell them, look, I, I'm, I'm really not asking you to do anything. Uh, you know, if you can show uh, fortitude and, and try to stand up for your beliefs, that's great. But candidly, look, you're a student. Your job is to work hard, get good grades, get a job. I, I don't blame you that you know you don't want to destroy your life before it begins. Uh, I blame the grown-ups. You know, university leaders, uh, professors, they, they, they're, they're the ones who, who can be in a position uh, to, to show the way for the next generation. That's, I think, uh, how it's supposed to be done. But uh, what was, I think David Boyce actually interestingly gave uh, an interview uh, a, a few weeks before I uh, talked about Yale, uh, where he said that you know what we're seeing come out of law schools and going to law firms is this is I'm just quoting him, uh, uh, paraphrasing him, it's destroying law firms uh, because the partners are now afraid to be associates, um, and and uh, you know I, one of my favorite things you alluded to I really love mentoring. Uh, kids, uh, whether it's my clerks or uh, associates, uh, learning about their interests and in, in how they want to uh, 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 work, uh, how they, what they want to do with their careers, how they want to affect change in the country. Uh, I love these conversations. And so one of my favorite things to do is have these th discussions. Uh, more and more recently, the topics, when we have these conversations, it's, it's with surprising frequency now. It's less about career development and more about avoiding career destruction. Uh, the, the, these episodes aren't talked about. They're not covered because nobody wants to talk about them. They don't. People don't lightly cancel themselves. They they talk privately about how they're facing something, and they're just trying to survive it. And and you'll never read about it because, understandably, they don't want the world to know. One thing that always uh, amazes me, and so you talk about associates now going to law firms and the partners are afraid of the associates. I've heard that too, but I would think that one thing that would resonate with at least the deans in law schools is. You know, so back when I was was you're in a room full of litigators, and, and you know, back when I was litigating, I just remember that you you were just a, a better litigator when you could get inside the head of your opponent and you know understand their arguments fully, 
uh, not denigrate them, take them quite seriously as if you were going to argue that side, and then you know, frame your own arguments, concede points when, when you should concede, but argue that your side, so we're not just cranking out trees that will collapse because they, they haven't been tested by the wind. We're cracking out a bunch of really bad lawyers, and the, those really bad lawyers, some of them are going to become really bad elected officials and really bad judges. I would think that when you would talk to deans, at least at that level, for those people who are going to be litigators, this would resonate. Have you had those conversations? Uh, I've tried to. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, I think some of you may remember what happened to Ilya Shapiro at Georgetown. All right, he, he took the position that uh, President Biden should not have uh, stated what he said about uh, how he's going to fill a Supreme Court vacancy. Um, and essentially, it's a, a, a debate about colorblindness uh, versus other approaches. And my pitch to the students, I actually uh, uh, went and, and, and gave a talk there, and I made this pitch. For those of you who disagree in good faith with Ilya Shapiro, you should be the last people, the last students who should want to get rid of him. That's the one person you want to make sure you get to have on your faculty, because you can argue with him. You can learn what his best arguments are. You can try to destroy him, um, but it'll help you get better. And so it's exactly what you're saying. You know, what uh, I, I was an appellate advocate uh, for, for much longer than, I, than I've been a judge, and we do moot courts. And uh, the whole purpose of that is to figure out, you know, all the different arguments on both sides. One of the things I always do with, with, the, with the team uh, sort of two-thirds of the way, pro I, I sort of throw out the question, okay, right now, if we could switch sides, obviously, that would be deeply unethical, it's a hypothetical, uh, you, you can't switch sides, but if we could, would we want to, right? Would we feel like we had a stronger case? Um, and again, that's just another way to sort of channeling every side, by definition, if you're at a big fancy firm where you get the tough cases, you know, one side is not obviously correct and one side is not obviously wrong. They're, it's closely contested, otherwise it would have settled, otherwise uh, any number of things would have happened. By definition, there are arguments on both sides, and you're supposed to learn in college and law school uh, that everybody has something to teach you, whether you end up ever agreeing with anything they ever say or not. And I do worry that we're losing that. Other questions? No? Okay. Uh, yes, right down here. Judge? Yeah, right here. Jim, maybe I missed it in your talk, but um, I'm not sure what is the source of the pressure that you feel. You're life tenured. We're both life tenured. Uh, our salary is uh, irreducible. It's not much, but it's irreducible. Uh, I have no social media accounts. I don't read any local newspapers. I, my colleagues don't pressure me. I'm not. I'm something of a loss as to where the pressure comes from. Yeah. So I could not agree with you more. Uh, but let me tell you a story. Um, I was this many years ago. I was a summer associate uh, here in D.C. at Gibson Dunn. Um, I'm at one of the fancy summer associate parties in a beautiful home in Georgetown. Uh, it's not just lawyers. It's also you know a lot of fancy people around town. It's sort of neat to, to look, look, look around and watch. And I remember sitting with uh, Gene Scalia, and then uh, I think he was a senior associate at the time, and somebody I'd gotten to know through the process. And I just told him, you know, look, uh, obviously I knew who his father was, and I asked him, you know, I, I've read about this thing called the greenhouse effect. I don't get it. And I asked exactly the same point you said, that, you know, if you, if you have views of one kind or other, then you just do them. I, you know, if you, you know, people judge, I, I know the judges don't agree on everything. But what I don't understand is if you have this view, why would you change given all the, 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 the benefits that you're talking about? And I will never forget this. Gene Scalia just looks back at me and says, Jim, you having fun here? Right. Yeah, it's a nice party. You, know, you enjoying the food? You enjoy oh, yeah, this, this is wonderful. I'm really glad to be here. Do you want to be invited back? And that's always just landed with me, is that's, you know, I'm actually an introvert. I don't like going to parties. <laughs> so I just assume be with my family, uh, including right now, to be honest. Um, but, you know, the others, uh, I, I grant that I'm, you know, mo most people aren't that way. Um, people like to be liked. People like to be invited back. You know, it's not about salary. You're absolutely right. You get the salary protection. 
Um, but perhaps that's not the only thing that makes some people tick. Uh, to those of you who, who don't know what the greenhouse effect is, so oh, Linda Greenhouse is, uh, was the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, and the idea was she would write nice things about George. She would blast you, and you would not be welcome at the Georgetown cocktail circuit. And so this ability for her opinion of you and your opinions to influence you is referred to as the, uh, the, as the greenhouse effect. Well, I, knew I believe it was Judge Silverman who coined the phrase. I, that may oh. very well be. Thankfully, he did not suffer from the greenhouse uh, effect, which is, uh, and, and we do miss him. Uh, well, this has been wonderful. Before, uh, before I have everybody uh, applaud and we exit the stage, I do have a couple of things for you. So uh, as, a, as a token of our incredible esteem, uh, we do have a complete selection of the Joseph Story commentaries on the Constitution of the United States. Thank and you. perhaps more importantly, I am, it gives me great pleasure to award you our Defender of the Constitution Award. Thank you all for coming here uh, this evening and have a pleasant trip home.